What are the biggest questions for our Michigan State Spartans heading into the 2022 season? Well, we've got 12 of them, and hey, we even have answers for some of these as well. What are we waiting for? Let's get going. Our Locked On Spartans, your daily podcast on the Michigan State Spartans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Friends, family, and more importantly, hey, you, the listeners of Locked on Spartans, how on earth are you guys doing? Hope your day is off to a splendid start. And up, up, before going any further, hey, today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. That's Bet Online, where the game starts. Thank you. Thank you for making Locked on Spartans your first listen every single day. And if, uh, yeah, this is a new show for you, hey, Welcome. Yeah, we like to have fun on here for, you know, the, the most part. When our Spartans aren't doing too well, we'll shoot you straight. But hey, in the off season, everything's fun and well so far. And uh, as we come closer to the start of the 2022 MSU football campaign, yeah, next week is going to be 50 days until kickoff against Western at home Friday night lights. Woo, can't wait. But hey, We got a lot of questions uh, that we have to address because we are inching closer towards kickoff. So starting to get the the jitters, the the angst, the the excitement too. You know, hey, not not all these questions are bad questions. Mm -mm. No, you'll learn more about that in a hot second. But first, it's housekeeping time. Uh, Please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast or YouTube channel however you choose to digest this media. And uh, number two, if you have any questions, comments, concerns. You have a great uh, tailgating tradition that you do that you just want to throw on me. Lockdownspartans at gmail.com is the place to find me. So without further ado, hey, let, let's go through all 12 of the biggest questions ahead of Michigan State's upcoming football season. And we're going to start with question number one. Let's just take it right off the top. Um, the run game, right? How Does the run game keep going? Um, Let's just start it off with the the negatives, the uh, reasons not to feel good about Michigan State's run game as we go in to another fun year of MSU football. (gasps) Kenneth Walker isn't here anymore. Uh, Kenneth Walker is not here anymore. If you can see on YouTube, yes, this gentleman right above my shoulder. He's in Seattle now. He's playing professional football, which is uh, kind of the level of football he played uh, last year in East Lansing, I mean, you don't just win the Doak Walker, the Walter Camp Award, you know, for no good reason. So, yes, it's a step back for no matter who takes his place. Okay, I'm not going to be negative this entire question. Let's talk about why us state fans can feel good about the upcoming run game. Okay, well, it, it doesn't hurt that, you know, Jarek Broussard has entered the mix. yes. The transfer from Colorado, you may already know his story, won Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Year two years ago. This is reminiscent of some Javon Ringer, Jehu Kalkrick action, because the second name I'm about to announce is the Thunder to Jarek Broussard's Lightning. Yes, that is Jalen Berger. Another transfer. Another transfer, this one from Wisconsin. Uh, Out of high school, highly rated four-star running back. He is uh, getting good. Straight line runner, pack some power, and uh, he's got some get up and go speed. If he breaks through that second level, then deuces, see ya, I'm going to the end zone. So, yes, it was not all too inspiring last year when Kenneth Walker was not in the games. But you get two transfers to supplement that. And also, hey, let's give a shout-out to Davion Prim here. He's been one of the few players that have just been showered in praise but by the coaching staff like I've never seen a player showered in praise before especially in spring football so or listen if you could resurrect anything out of Jordan Simmons Eli Collins I, more the merrier more the merrier so that is going to be the big storyline going into this season is yeah last year you win 11 games and a big reason of that is Mr. K9 Mr. Kenneth Walker um but really let's just take a deeper look into that with our second question going into the 2022 season and it's how 
is Peyton Thorne going to do without K-9 as well? That's right. We're doing some Kenneth Walker banter right off the top. We're just going to nip it right in the bud here. And let's talk about the quarterback. Yes, coming back, Peyton Thorne with, hey, Jaden Reed. It's awesome. You know, we got some promising young receivers that we'll talk about here in a little bit. However, Kenneth Walker helped that passing game, I think, more than a lot of people realize. And these are two stats pointed out in a piece written by our guy Colton Pouncey of The Athletic. So just want to credit them before rattling off these stats. And it's that Peyton Thorne uh, threw for 12 touchdowns and just two interceptions while on play action passes. Teams would nearly have to sell out on the run uh, because they were scared crapless uh, of Kenneth Walker. And for great reason, I would be terrified too if I was a defensive coordinator or a linebacker or a safety on the other team. But it's not just that fun touchdown to interception ratio. Also, Peyton Thorne ranked 11th nationally in yards gained per completion on play action passes and had 10 completions of 40 plus yards off a play fake. And that was a sixth in the FBS. So, uh, yeah, that's three stats for you right there. And also, here's a question within the question How many flea flickers are we going to see this year? Hey, see. Told you I had some fun questions for you today, but yeah, I interested to know if the flea flicker is still going to be used essentially once a game, kind of like how it was last year, seemed to work. And Jay Johnson, when he was asked about it, at, I think a few times last season, would swear up and down and say, "Like, no, nah, that's that's not a it's not a trick play. Why why are you accusing me of using gimmicky plays? A flea flicker is just a advanced play action. Like, come on, relax." So. We'll see how it goes with, with the new running game. But, hey, again, it, it's not all entirely on the running backs as well. You, you do have solid interior offensive linemen coming back. You know, Matt Carrick, J.D. Duplain, Nick Samak, Brian Green, the transfer out of Washington State. So you, you do have good bodies on that line as well to help the run game, help the running backs. So that is the running discussion portion of, you know, the, the 12 questions right here. We're staying on the offensive side of the ball. And I know you're thinking, you're like, well, hold on, hold on. Like, what about the pass defense? Are we just going to ignore that? Come on, we got three segments of questions here. you got to hang with me a little bit. Uh, We're going to stay on the offensive side of the ball. And question number three is, who steps up in Jalen Naylor's spot? Now, whether that – you can interpret that any way you want, really. Uh, Whether I mean – who's going to be the second wide receiver on this team or who's going to, you know, slide in and just fill that empty role, be a strong third receiver because uh, Trey Mosley is going to have something to say about being the second wide receiver. You know that I'm a big Trey Mosley guy. He is Mr. Reliable. He's, he's always there for you. You know, if you need eight yards on a third down, he'll get you 10. That's right. No, Trey Mosley is awesome. However, Got some high ceiling guys that are going to be looking to fill that third wide receiver position as well. Montori Foster stepped up last year. Listen, Jalen Naylor was out for a few games with an injury, and in those four games that Naylor was out, Montori Foster put up 10 catches, 141 yards, and also showed that straight line speed on a fly route on a 52 yard touchdown against Maryland. So you see some good bones there with Montori Foster. Of course, you know what name's coming next. The prodigal son. That's right. The fan favorite, Neon Keon Coleman. He came in last year as a true freshman, started to get some solid PT at the end of the year. Highly, highly rated four-star kid out of Louisiana. And man, you like what you see from him. If he could hit his ceiling or even come close to hitting his ceiling sophomore year coming up, woo boy. Oh yeah, we're gonna like to see that. And also, I mean, listen, six foot four Christian Fitzpatrick is gonna have to say something to say is gonna have something to say about this. A young gun like true freshman Jeremy Bernard could be well in the mix as well. Another highly rated four star kid, true freshman, but also early enrolled back in January, so he has been with the program for already a few months now. By the time he hits the field in the fall. It's kind of like a, being a freshman 2.0, you know? He's, he's not completely raw. He's a very um, acclimated guy to the college game so far. Um, Antonio Gates Jr., if I could point out another four-star true freshman. So, yes, um, not a lot to worry about with the wide receiver room. No doubt about that. And then just one more question about the offense. Eh, for, for now. Um, 
is, are the young offensive linemen ready? Are the young offensive linemen ready? And uh, I'm going to call myself out right here if you're watching on YouTube. I spelled lineman run. That should be uh, M-E-N instead of M-A-N. Oh, well, whatever. Uh, can't read, can't write, go green, go white. Uh, all right. So yeah, the young offensive lineman, you've heard me and a lot of others talk my, my lips off about how we're at am for the offensive line. And listen, we already highlighted the guys coming back. A lot of good guys in the interior and also on the ends, Spencer Brown, who got a little bit of playing time at the end of the season, especially the peach bowl. And also, well, yes, of course your left tackle Jarrett horse. So you got a solid offensive line, but what happens if those guys are gone? Like you, MSU lost a lot of depth last year. They lost AJ Curie, Matt Allen, Luke Campbell, Blake Buter, and Kevin Jarvis. My guy, Kevin Jarvis, love Kevin Jarvis. And now that's being replaced with Brandon Baldwin, Ethan Boyd, Gino Vandenmark, Dallas Fincher, Kevin Wigginton. Um, not a lot of experience right there. Am I Chalking it up as, uh, oh, well, these guys aren't going to be good. No, no, it, it's it's not that. It's just that we haven't really seen them play. So maybe they are going to be the surprise of the season where if a guy does go down, because let's be honest, especially as Michigan State fans, we know that offensive linemen injuries are inevitable. So, yes, can one of these guys be the guy when they have to step up in the middle of the season at the end of the season or God forbidding at the start of the season. So that's going to be a massive storyline going into the season as well. We got eight more questions that we got to address guys, but uh, I just got to talk your ear off about rock auto. That's right. It is the fine family folks at rock auto. They're always treating you right. They're always treating your car right, your van right, your wallet night right. And with the ever increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you ever need. Why would you endure often just, you know, pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning like, oh, does your Hyundai need a gababble geeber flap? Like, I, I don't know. That could very well be a car part. I have no idea. I know nothing about cars. Um, but luckily, with Rock Auto, I don't have to know anything about cars. Uh, save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why would you choose to spend 30 50 or even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership, you would only do it if you were a giant circus clown. Here. But you're not a circus clown. You are a smart person. You use Rock Auto. You take advantage of this wonderful family-owned business. They are just the cream of the crop when it comes to auto. So go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on in there. Hey, how'd you hear about us, Box? So they know that we sent you. Amazing selection reliably low prices, all the parts your car or truck will ever need. That's rockauto.com. And before getting into some more questions, hey, just want to thank you for making Locked on Spartans your first listen every single day. Please rate us, please review us, please subscribe. Do whatever uh, makes you happy. I'm not going to be too pushy here, but it's a recommendation if you don't mind. All right, question number five. Let's talk pass defense. Let's talk pass defense because that that's a uh, yeah, big story going into next season. So question number five, point blank, is uh, the savior of the transfer portal, potentially, is just how good is cornerback Amir Speed? How good is Amir Speed? Uh, because that is going to predicate a lot of what's going to be happening next season. Um, listen, I'm not going to go through every single number, every stat, every whatever of how bad the pass defense was for Michigan State last season. But I will touch on how bad it was at the end of last season. And that is, well, the last six games, you let up 33 points per game on defense and gave up 350-plus passing yards in four of those games. And one of the games that you didn't, you still let up more than 300 yards uh, against Penn State in a snowstorm. And then that sixth game was against Pitt's like 14th string quarterback. And yeah, he didn't hit 350 yards. Regardless, wasn't that great. Uh, probably still the reason I drink today. But hey, that's neither here nor there. Let's talk about Amir Speed. Sixth year in college coming up for Amir Speed. Big one guy. Six foot three, which is definitely on the taller side, the lengthier side for cornerbacks, especially in college. And what's not to like about him? He, he's a Georgia kid. He played in that amazing defense last year. Kind of. 
Kind of. He started three games at cornerback, had a little injury issue, and then kind of, you know, took um, his uh, sorry his seat on the second row of that death chart. Did a lot of special teams work, but hey, things coming out of camp are good things so far out of East Lansing. And also, I will say this: the last six games of the year, last year, you were dealing with some injury issues. Like I've talked up and down about this, that Ronald Williams was starting to come along here, and then okay, he gets hurt. You have Chuck Brantley, who, yay, the hero of the end of the Michigan game. That's right, 37-33. Um, he gets hurt. And Marquis Lowry, another guy, kind of nagging injury there. And Kimbra moves inside. That's right, Chester Kimbra. And that will move us to question number six right now, which is how much does moving Kimbra to nickel help this team? Instead of being out wide. On his own island, uh, you know, more times than not, he is going to be moved into that nickel spot. Now, what that does is that's going to allow him to stick with, you know, underneath routes. He's not going to be chasing guys down the field. He will have help up top by safeties. He will be taking on slot receivers, perhaps some tight ends, if you will. The running back out of the backfield, it's going to be a different assignment for him. And I think a change of scenery and a change of responsibility, and a change of you know position, so to speak, that can only help our guy Kimbra, right? And because it, I'm not an expert, I'm not an expert at all, but uh, body language is not there <laughs> as the games kind of went on, and oh my, the secondary is getting picked to shreds, and one guy in particular seems to be getting picked on more than the others. Uh-oh. So, yeah, I, I think this is going to be um, an open position change uh, from Kimbra's side, from MSU side, and probably from, from our side as well. So how much will it help? I, I, th- I think it can't hurt because, listen, the only way to go is up for this pass defense. And, like, I wish I could say that with a joking tone, but no. Like, quite literally, the only way to go is up for this pass defense. So that's what we got here. Uh, so let's, let's hope that the nickel – position move helps now it's not at all bad questions on the defense because this next question might be the most fun question that we have of the whole litter here and it's just four four words who starts at linebacker that's right who starts at linebacker what an incredible question an incredible incredible problem for Michigan State to have here because um this isn't a thing where it's like, oh, God, who's going to start for us? Uh, oh, this isn't a good lineup of players that we can throw out there. It's quite the opposite. You, you are bleeding talent at this position if you're Michigan State. Uh, last year, you have Cal Halliday, who uh, made the Athletics All-American freshman team last year. And then you had Quaveras Crouch last year. Well, he's out of here. Um, he had the transfer portal. So who else do you have? Oh, you, you just uh, you know Aaron Brule from Mississippi State. Uh, Oh, you know, just Jacoby Winman, a guy that was top 15 in tackles in the nation last year. And uh, that's right, Darius Snow, all but formally moving to linebacker. Um, He's the best tackler that was on the team last year, in my opinion. It only makes sense. Yes, Michigan State runs a 4-2, meaning they have two linebackers. But I think this will be more of a 4-3 look, especially with Darius. Whenever Darius is on that field to be that nickel, if they want to call it that. He, he He's a linebacker. So my guess it could be Jacoby Winman, Darius Snow, and Cal Halliday, you know, walking out there September 2nd to face the Broncos of Western Michigan. But would it surprise me to just see uh, Jacoby Winman and Air Brule out there? Or, you know, what? let's get nuts. Um, these guys are going to be, you know, fighting for some good second uh, string snaps too. Is Ma'a now Teote? And also, hey, Ben Van Summeren, who uh, was in the transfer portal for a hot second, took his name out. So, look, you're looking at, what, six guys, Cal Halliday, Aaron Brule, Jacoby Winman, Darius Snow, Ma'a, and Ben Van Summeren. Like, you could do a lot worse. That is going to be one of the upper tiers of linebacker rooms in the Big Ten. And uh, it's got me smiling as we get uh, just, you know, closer and closer to kickoff by the minutes and one more question about defense how much impact will this new pass rush have now last year you are going to replace 12 sacks i'm sorry 12 and a half sacks i should correct myself 
between Drew Beasley and Jacob Panashuk, who are uh, no longer with us on the team, which is a shame. I did love watching those guys play. But, uh, you know, I also love watch, uh, watching Jeff Petrowski play as well. Five and a half sacks is what he had last year. That is the leader amongst returners on this team. So he's going to presumably take up one of these defensive end positions. On the other end, you have Chris Boggle. Uh, you might know his story. You probably do if you've listened to this here podcast. We're very high on him. Uh, is that, yeah, he was down at Florida for a few years. Former top 75 recruit. And actually, if you take his high school recruit ranking, if he committed to Michigan State right out of high school, he would have been Michigan State's 16th best commit of all time in the 24-7 sports era. So the better part of this whole millennium. But yeah, good frame, has all the tools, and here is the million-dollar question is how fast and how much of an impact can pass rush specialist coach Brandon Jordan have here? That's right. Time in with Kevin Vickerson as well, who's on the staff. Marco Coleman, who is on the staff as well. This is who you want coaching your pass rush. And also when you have guys right behind Petrowski and Boga like Brandon Wright, that's right. Guy looked like a missile last year at the end of the season on third down. He was great. Tank Brown, who was another highly rated recruit that transferred from Minnesota. Big Michael Fletcher. That's right. Coming up, I'm, I believe, his third year at Michigan State. Let's make some hay, baby. So, yes, with the pass rush. And also doesn't hurt that, you know, you get Scott Slade in the middle. Uh, yeah, we're going to have all sorts of fun in the middle there, too. But, yes, the pass rush along the edge. How much of an impact can that have when you're replacing two solid players in Beasley and Panashuk? Uh, stay tuned. I know you will, uh, and I, you know I will. So, yeah, let's get nuts. Uh, we are eight questions down, four to go. But I just got to talk your ear off about bet online. That's right, bet online. Listen, it, sports are slowing down in the summer. But the fun at Bet Online is not, and hey, we got the uh, we got the Open coming up this weekend, or the British Open, uh, whatever you want to call this thing. Bet on it. Uh, also, take my word for it. This is not a guarantee, but Shane Lowry at twenty-two to one, he's due for a second claret jug. He's been playing decent so far this year, and uh, at the old course of St Andrews, he is going to shine. So, Shane Lowry at twenty-two to one, put a shekel on that at Bet Online, and uh, yeah, just get. 22 bucks for every dollar that you wager with Bet Online. That's right, your number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, news, including this year's Major League Baseball season. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, that's right, and scores. And betonline.net remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. Gang, betonline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, golf, my three favorite physical sports. Head to the website today, use your mobile device, learn more about the trends in action that is at Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, uh, question number nine. We already hit, like hit the offense hard, we hit the defense hard. Let's start this off with just coaching right now. And the question is, can the in-game coaching get even better? Now, I will say it's it's not a total dud. I want to, you know, just disclaim this right now. With I'm overall, I'm fine with how Mel Tucker and company coach their football games, but I would be remiss not to look back at what I called kind of glaring errors last year. Like, look, the end of the first half against Rutgers was a complete debacle and kind of like really inexcusable, so to speak, uh, not calling a timeout, nearly missing out on your field goal opportunity. And that whole thing was so probably flustering for a kicker that, yeah, the, the kick didn't go all too well at the end of half. But you were fortunate because it was against Rutgers. Uh, and you can get away with stuff like that against Rutgers. Or fast forward a few weeks later, or maybe it was just one week later. I'm sorry I'm having a hard time remembering. But the Indiana game. You are 20 yards away from the end zone with four minutes left and a five-point lead. You have the best running back in the nation, and you threw to the end zone. You threw to the end zone, and that led in a pick. Indiana had a chance to drive down the field and win the game, but, um, oh, yeah, that's right. They were Indiana. So you're fortunate that it happened against a lesser team like that. And, yes, I 
conflicting reports on if that was an audible to throw to the end zone or not. Regardless, I think it's a good idea to coach your players. We ain't throwing in this situation because that could have been very scary. Now, again, it has not been like this. Uh, Mel Tucker's entire tenure with the play calling, I think overall has been great. I mean, hell, Jay Johnson was a maestro during that Michigan game last year. I think, you know, the Penn State game down the stretch, I think they handled that very well. Um, I know it was 4th and 15 in field goal range, but they went for the end zone. And, yes, I know this play worked up here. That's right. If you can see on YouTube, I got that signed by Jaden Reed, that play that turned into a touchdown. But also, you didn't have any kickers, so you kind of had to do it. And so he didn't, you know, force a a kid that was struggling kicking out there, which I, I like that move, too. Later in that game, fourth and three. Okay, well, loss of one yard, but hey, I can't really kick like a thirty-five yard field goal right here. So I, I that's a long way. That's a long way of me saying that I, I think it's solid, but can it get a little better? Because those major hiccups last year, I don't know if those turn into wins against better teams, like say a Penn State, for example. Uh, say maybe you do this on the road at Washington. I don't know how well that's going to turn out for you um, because these are close games. And speaking of close games, how about question number 10? Uh, Kicking. Now what? What what goes on with kicking? After a 17-year career here by Matt Coughlin, the all-time leading point scorer at Michigan State, big question mark when it comes to the kicking game. Uh, It's either going to be Steven Rusnak, who last year, listen, not not a sterling year, um, missed the uh, field goal against Purdue, went four of five on PATs, or an... I think this is who it's going to be. True freshman Jack Stone reigning out of Texas. He is a top five kicker uh, per Chris Saylor kicking. Uh, You know, they rate a bunch of kickers. I trust them the most when it comes to kicker rankings. So he's one of the best in the nation coming in. Can you do it, though, early on? And he didn't kick a ton of field goals at high school either. I think he only made three, four, maybe five his senior year in high school. A little different to do it, too, when you're surrounded by 76,000 fans at Spartan Stadium. So, yeah, uh, college kicking is a fickle game. It's a scary game. And when you've got a, a, a pretty solid one like we had in Coughlin for quite some time, you don't realize how blessed you are. And hopefully we don't have to realize really how blessed we are as we see a kid struggle this year because, listen, I, four games last year were decided by five points or less. And that game that was decided by five points, the Indiana game, maybe it doesn't go that way too because Coughlin buried two very long kicks. It was probably his best game at Michigan State. So, yeah, college kicking definitely gets a nod here for being a massive question mark, especially when conference games get close, road games get close. Uh, you guy can get jittery out there. So if, whether it's Rusnak, Jack Stone, or a guy whose name hasn't even – Appeared yet. I guess you can just grab a kid off the streets of Shaw Lane uh, on campus. So, yeah, hey, any way you slice it, MSU needs a kicker uh, next year. Stay tuned to find out who it's going to be. And, uh, yeah, speaking of new kids on the block, like our guy Jack Stone, question number 11, how many freshmen will have an impact this year, if any? If any, um, maybe not a lot do, but I think that we will be seeing some some of these kids. Like Jaden Mangum, four-star, uh, projected to be a safety, maybe a nickel. I think he gets a good amount of reps in. Very long kid, great wingspan. So that's a kid that you're going to want out there. Or maybe even Jeremy Bernard, kid we already touched on, the wide receiver. Top 250 kid in the nation, early enrollee as well. And just you know electric at wide receiver. I think very highly of him. I think he's going to have an incredible career at Michigan State. Is it going to be Alex Van Sumeren down at defensive line, which is a busy position group, so it will be hard for even a kid as talented as him to see a lot of playing time, but hey, kid's uh, obviously highly rated. Um, Inside the top 200, I believe, per 24-7 sports, if not very close to top 200, so a lot of eyes are going to be on him. And uh, listen, God forbid, Kaitlin Hauser has to come in We don't want this to happen. Obviously not because I don't think Kaden Hauser is going to be good, but it's because if that happens, that means uh, something really bad has happened to Peyton Thorne, and we're not trying to see that happen. But if it does happen, you know, let's say he jumps over Noah Kim in the death chart, how's it going to go? 
And let's just give shout outs to, hey, maybe uh, Caleb Coley uh, at, at cornerback can, you know, get some work in. Antonio Gates Jr. one more time. Uh, let's go with Dylan Tatum right here. Very talented kid out of West Bloomfield. And uh, one time from Leek Spencer as well. Another safety I think very highly of. So, but we'll we'll see how many, you know, freshmen actually get. Not just snaps, but, you know, meaningful snaps in meaningful games. Uh, you know, conference play, all that fun stuff. So, I'll say for the upteenth time, stay tuned. Uh, and... Last question here it has nothing to do about our team. It's just the other teams too. You know, this, this seems like maybe a cop out question, but really like what is going on with the other teams? Uh, like does Thorne's dad coach at Western give the Broncos any edge? Uh, who on earth starts at quarterback for Washington? Is it going to be Michael Penix? Is it going to be Sam Heward? It, like, I don't know. Like it, we're so used to facing Maryland in November when they are lawn mentally checked out of the season by then now you get them the first day of October will they still be mentally in check into their season in week five of the college football year October 8th is Ohio State's first road game I want to say that one more time because it's so utterly ridiculous October 8th is Ohio State's first road game uh, first of all, how does that even happen? Uh, second of whatever. Well, going that far into your season with just playing at home, throw the Buckeyes off if they come into a hostile Spartan Stadium atmosphere. Can that throw off their game a little bit that maybe the home life was too cushy for the first five weeks, that by the time you come here in week six, that, uh-oh, like, oh, wow, we're actually getting tested here. We have some adversity. Who's to say? Again, I mean, we already know this. Ohio State's going to be a wagon this year, but if there's anything that could throw them off their game, it might be week six being your first <laughs> road game of the year. Jesus. Anyway, uh, like will Michigan be able to sustain anything like what they had on defense last year? And yes, while their offense has a lot of good tools, will it be clicking by the end of October? Should they choose to keep this two quarterback system going? Will that cause a rift? Will Jim Harbaugh just decide to try to leave for the NFL in the middle of the season next year? I, who's to say? I have no idea. And like, you know, it's just stuff like this. Like, what was COVID year Indiana really a flash in the pan? But was that just a fun one-off story, or can they get back on track with Tom Allen and company and be a, a decent team next year? I. Who's to say? I, these are questions that are going to be unanswered until the season actually starts, but. Until then, hey, let's just try to enjoy the rest of the offseason, gang. Right? Again, the middle of next week will be 50 days away. And also, to celebrate that, we will have a podcast. We did this last year. 50 reasons to be excited for Michigan State football. That'll be next week, though. So, you know, keep it tuned here. But until then, hey, thank you all for making Locked on Spartans your first listen every single day day you guys are truly the best uh cannot get enough of you Uh, all your emails you guys always have great things to say uh some great ideas as well some great questions if i've not gotten to a question that you sent maybe like a week or two or a month ago like i do have it written down it's just things have been so busy in east lansing that we have to skip them but hey hopefully we will be getting into them a little more especially as you know there's a football dead period as well so um yeah keep the emails coming you guys are the best And also, hey, let's keep a great week rolling right here. We can do this together, guys. We can make it through the rest of the offseason together. I believe in us. You guys are the best. Thanks again for making us your first listen every single day. Love every single one of you. Stay awesome. Go green. 